Please take your seats. Today's speaker, Alexander Havard, is both, the, is both the author of the book, Created for Greatness, The Power of Magnanimity, and the founder of the Havard Virtuous Leadership Institute. The Institute, an international network of consultants, promotes the classical virtues as the basis of effective leadership and personal ex excellence by hosting executive level leadership seminars to both public and private sector executives. Mr. Havard was born in Paris and is the grandson of two Russian immigrants who escaped the Bolshevik Revolution in the 1920s. Mr. Havard was educated in Paris to pursue a career in law. Since 1986, he has practiced law in Strasbourg, Helsinki, and since 2001, he has practiced in Moscow. Today's presentation, entitled Igniting Greatness, the Power of Magnanimity, promises to provide an inspiring perspective on virtuous leadership. Please join me in a warm U.S. Army War College welcome to Mr. Alexander Havard. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chuck. I would like, first of all, to thank all those people who made it possible this meeting with you today. It's a great honor for me to be here. I'm used to come to the United States twice a year to spread out the virtuous leadership system and ideas. And today, I have to say, I feel very, very happy to be with people uh, of such capabilities as you and ready to hear this message of virtuous leadership. I am a French man, and I spent 27 years of my life in France, but I was educated in a very international background. As you've heard, I have two grandparents who escaped the Bolshevik Revolution in 1919, 1920. I have a Georgian grandfather who escaped also Soviet Union in 1924 from Tbilisi. I have a French grandmother who is the son of the French general who died in between the First and the Second World War. So this, I am thankful to God for this international background that I had and the great education they have given to me. I studied law in Paris. I practiced as a barrister, as a solicitor, as a lawyer, I don't know how you say here, in Paris, in Strasbourg, and I moved to Finland, Helsinki, 1989. And I worked as a barrister, as a lawyer in Finland in the beginning of the 1990s, and one day a friend of mine asked me to give a class to his students on the history of European integration. While well, keeping in mind that the European Union after the Second World War was not what it is now. It was another institution with other kind of people. It was another world. And I used, to talk, I used to talk to my students about the founders of European Union, great people like Robert Schuman, Konrad Adenauer, Alcide de Gasperi, Jean Monnet. These were great people we had after the Second World War in Europe. And I noticed that speaking about these people to my students, that my students were very much amazed to see that there were such people, they were very interested in human beings. I noticed that they had much more passion and interest for human beings than for laws and regulations. <laughs> <laughs> At that moment, I, I came to understand that because the question they were making to me was, how do you become like this? They didn't put the question directly like this, but the idea was this one. I want to be like this man. I want to be like that lady. How do you do that? How do you get the character they had? How do, you, do you, how do you share the ideals they have? And then I came to the conclusion that university, the university is not, in fact, doing its own job. The university in general nowadays is giving people information, helps people, people become good specialists in a very spe specific field, philosophy, law, science, whatever it is, know-how. The world is producing managers, people who know how to do certain things. But my students were asking me something else. They were asking me, how do you become a human being? Not how do you do those things? They were asking me for education. And the university was not giving them education. Sounds crazy. University not giving education, but giving information. And huge 
huge crowds of students asking you for education that they don't get from the university. So I came to the conclusion at that moment that I had to quit with law, I had to give up with my profession of lawyer, and I had to dedicate myself to this that is necessary to my, for my students, that was the need. So I stopped practicing law in a period of two, three years, a transitional period. I began to gather material. I had also philosophical education, not only education in law. Professional experience, of course, is working as a barrister in different countries for different years. And I came to the conclusion that the new topic that these people need is virtuous leadership. Why not simply leadership? Not simply leadership because we have abused this word very much. When you say leadership, many people understand what they want. You have 50 definitions of what leadership is. 50, not less than 50. Everything depends on your point of view, on your values, on your approach, on your mentality, on who you are as a human being. And who you are as a human being will define your definition of leadership. Because leadership is not management. It's a very different science that has to, it's a philosophy of life. So your approach to leadership depends very much on what is your philosophy of life. What is the image that you have of yourself and what is the image that you have of your people? Many, for many people, leadership is about skills, it's about techniques, it's about manipulation. It's just about directing people towards a game, uh, towards not a game, towards an aim. Sometimes it's towards a game. Unfortunately, so by thinking about all this topic and by thinking about my own students that brought me to this science of leadership, thinking about them, I understood that the real leadership, in fact, is virtuous leadership, and I will explain you why virtuous leadership. All of you, you've read Aristotle, Aristotle and ethics. All of you know that even before Aristotle, Plato, and even before Plato, Pindar, Eschil, they had written about the four fundamental virtues of character. And I'm sure all of you remember them. <laughs> the red ones, the red ones, self-control or temperance, justice, courage or fortitude, and prudence or practical wisdom. These are the four, we call them, cardinal virtues from the Latin cardo, which means the hinge on which all the other virtues turn. In order to have a virtue, you have to have, first of all, you have to practice one of those, the four of those ones. They are the fundamental virtues that helps us build our life. These are virtues of action. They are not, um, they are not I would say, intellectual notions. They are virtues of action. They are practical. They are habits, stable habits of our personality, things that we develop through repetition by education. At any age, we can begin to foster in ourselves, develop in ourselves those virtues. Those four fundamental virtues are habits of character. This means that we have to understand what character is about. All of you know that we have temperament and character. These are the two aspects of personality, temperament and character. Temperament is something biological. It has to do with genetics. You're born hot-blooded or you're born shy. And you cannot play a game. If you're shy, you will not play the hot-blooded. You will destroy yourself because you cannot, you cannot change your biology and your genetics. This is what we call the temperament. Each of us has a very specific temperament, can be shy, can be choleric, can be sanguinic, whatever it is. The Greek, ancient Greek had classification like this that we still use today, and they are very good, very important. Well, you have people more introvert and people more extrovert. That's obvious. And it has to do with our own nature. And it is a nature that is given to us. It is not something we can change. But on the foundation of this nature, of this temperament, we build what we call character. Character in Greek means a seal, a seal that is stamped on temperament so that temperament ceases to dominate your personality. So if you have no character, if you don't develop those virtues we're speaking about, you have only temperament. You are a bio biological product. 
you depend completely on external stimuli. The more you have character, the more you control your own biology, the more you are a spiritual being, the more, in fact, as the ancient Greek were used to say, the more you are a human being. Because those virtues we're speaking about are spiritual virtues, which means that they are spir it's a spiritual aspect for personality, which means animals don't have them. Animals react only to external stimuli. Human beings can build character, which is a spiritual strength that they have in order to cease to be dominated by their own biology. When you've said that, we, we see that we begin to speak a lot now about freedom. Leadership is a science of freedom. It means that none of us here is born a leader. You become leader when you practice those virtues. Those virtues are dynamic forces. The Latin word for virtue is virtus, and virtus means strength, power. When you practice those virtues, what happens? You acquire a dynamic force that gives you the capacity to do what we expect from a leader. If you have practical wisdom or prudence, what can you do? You can make almost all the time right decisions. I have not said correct decisions. All of us here are able to make correct decisions all the time. But to make right decisions, <clears throat> you need to have character. Courage gives you the capacity to stick to your decisions, to stay the course, to implement your decisions when, even when the goings get tough. Endurance. Courage gives you also the capacity to dare, to take a risk. And this is very important in leadership. No capacity to take a risk, no daring, no leadership at all. No change, no initiative. No greatness. Self-control. What does this give you? Self-control gives you the capacity to direct the energy, this vital energy that comes from your passions and emotions that are very good thing in themselves, to direct them towards the fulfillment of your mission. To put passion, energy in the exercise of your own mission in life. For this, you need self-control. If you don't have self-control, you'll be destroyed by your own passions. You will not only not be able to direct them towards the fulfillment of your mission, those passions and emotions will just destroy you. And the fourth virtue is justice. Justice is the virtue of interaction. It is the virtue that gives you the capacity to give each one what is due to him. It is the virtue that gives you the capacity to enter the heart of people. It is the virtue of communication. It is the virtue of truthfulness. It is the virtue of simplicity, sincerity. Speak the truth. It is the virtue of empathy, mercy. These are virtues that are rooted in justice, virtues of communication. We are personal beings, but we are also social beings. And the virtue of this fact that we are social beings is the virtue of justice. And justice is a virtue of character before being a a notion of political science. Many people speak about justice, but they are not just. They don't have justice as a virtue in their own character. But they love speaking about the concept of justice, especially social justice. But we are not in social justice. We are in justice as an, as an attribute of your own character. So those four fundamental virtues you heard about when you were young at school, Remember them always. They are foundational for your own life and for the life of a leader because they give you the capacity to do certain things that people that don't have those virtues cannot. Virtue is not a value. It's much more. It's a dynamic force. Many people have great values. Country, family, God. These are great values. But if you don't have, if you don't have the virtues to achieve those values, I don't care about your values. They're dead. You can, be a, you can consider family as a great value. But if you and your wife, you don't have minimum of self-control, your marriage will stay in five years. You can, have, you can love your country. But if you don't practice courage, 
You cannot defend your country. You will surrender immediately. You can love God. But God is demanding with His children. And if you don't practice practical wisdom and courage, what kind of believer you're going to be? You see what I mean? I mean that we speak a lot about, about value-based leadership. That's good. I'm not against this. But I tell you, it's still nothing. The virtue-based leadership is the true leadership. The, the thing that gives you the capacity to acquire a strength that other people don't have. The strength that gives you the capacity to lead the others. To do the things that, is, that are specific to leaders. But then when you have thought about, when you see those four fundamental virtues, the, green, the blue, uh, the red one, you say, well, but every, any human being needs those virtues, not only leaders. In the life of an individual that has nothing to do with leadership, if one of those four fundamental virtues is missing fundamentally, everything collapses in his life. Everything. If you're not just, you better stay home because you cannot just interact with people. If you have not the capacity to make right decisions because you lack prudence, you're dangerous. You're danger for everybody. If you have no self-control, you look like an animal, not like a human being. If you have no courage, people will say, these guys of that woman, she's unable, he's unable to walk the talk. We laugh at him. Speaks a lot, but do nothing. So if, some, if one of those four virtues is really fundamentally lacking in the life of an individual, everything collapses in his life. And when we said that, we just begin to speak about leadership. I want to say that before becoming leaders, we have to be human beings. Before practicing the specific virtues of leadership that are, in fact, magnanimity and humility, first of all, we have to practice the four fundamental virtues. I've known people who want to practice the fundamental virtues, the specific virtues of leadership that is magnanimity, the virtue of greatness, and humility, the virtue of service, without practicing the four others. <laughs> it doesn't work, because those four virtues are foundational. Foundational. You walk on them. Without ground, you cannot do anything. There is no magnanimity, no greatness. When there is no prudence, or when there is no courage, or when there is no self-control, or no justice, so the first thing we can say here at that level of, our, <coughs> of our, our thoughts is that those four fundamental virtues we heard a lot from the ancient Greeks are foundational virtues. They are the foundation of our life and the life of any person. And they are the foundation also of leadership. But then we come to the substance of leadership. What is the substance? What is the, the, the heart of it? The heart of it is magnanimity. What is magnanimity? Very everywhere we see people speaking about greatness, 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 greatness. And it's a beautiful word in English, sounds very nice, greatness. But very few people know that behind the concept of greatness, there is in fact a virtue. And if we don't practice this virtue, there is no greatness at all, or it is false greatness. And this virtue is a stable habit of character, like all the other virtues. It's not a psycho bubble. It's not self-esteem. I'm not saying that self-esteem is a bad thing, but you can wake up in the morning with a very high level of self-esteem, and in the evening, when you see what has happened today, you feel your weaknesses. The level of your self-esteem can be very low. I'm sure this happens to you. It happens to me. Which means that self-esteem is a feeling. It's not a virtue. The virtue behind greatness is not self-esteem. The virtue behind greatness is magnanimity. And it is not a new word that I am pronouncing here. It's a very ancient word that has 3,000 years of Existence. 3,000 years people have used the concept of magnanimity. The Greek people were used to speak about megalopsychia, the great soul. Cicero, 44 before Christ, translated this word by 
magnanimitas that gives the, the English magnanimity. High-mindedness, high-heartedness. These are Anglo-Saxon translations of magnanimity. What is that? Very often, many people are not just cannot just pronounce it. One time I was giving a, t a class on magnanimity in Finland, and one student was in English, and one student came to me and said, what you're speaking, what you've said about magnetism, it was just incredible. <laughs> and here in the United States a year ago, I was speaking of magnanimity two hours, and someone came to me, hey, this magnanimity stuff, what's that? The magnanimity. I understand it's not an easy word to pronounce, magnanimity, which means big soul, big heart. What is this? Magnanimity, it is the striving of the spirit, of the will, and the heart towards great things. It is a virtue. It is a virtue. It's not an emotion. It is a virtue. The striving of the spirit towards great thing, the striving of the heart, the spirit, the mind. Everything here in a person is involved. His intellect, his will, and his heart are involved in the magnanimity virtue. It is the virtue of action. It is the virtue that helps you helps you move forward in life because it is a virtue of human hope. It is a virtue of human hope in the sense that you are aware of your own talents and gifts. And if you're a believer, you're thankful to God for those gifts that you have received from Him through nature. You feel your responsibility for the gifts and talents that you have. You're aware of those gifts that you have. You're not proud of those gifts. You're aware of your dignity. You're aware of your personal dignity and greatness without being proud. Because in a way or another, humility is the habit of living in the truth. This is the definition of humility. Humility is the habit of living in the truth. And the truth is that you and me, we have strength and weaknesses. If we are not aware of the gift that we have, if we are not aware of our talents, we are not humble. We are not humble. In our society, the word humility has been completely misunderstood. If you open the Oxford Dictionary and you look at humility, you'll be surprised. You have there not a definition of humility. You have a definition of small-mindedness. Oxford Dictionary. Which means that these words that I'm speaking to you about today with you are very important words. They are very precise. We have not the right to, do, to <clears throat> deteriorate them and to give them another meaning. They have a scientific meaning. And it's not a psychobabble thing. They have a scientific meaning. Humility is the habit of living in the truth. The truth is that you and me, we have certain good things. We have weaknesses, yes, but we have strength. We have gifts, we have talents, and we have to multiply this. And we have to be thankful to God if we're believers for the things He has given to us. So this is what magnanimity is about, awareness of your own dignity and greatness, and multiplication of your own talents, multiplication, the capacity to put more energy in developing your own talents and gifts than fighting against your defects. You have to fight against your defects and against your flaws. All of us, we have to do that. But it's through your pity when you see people who put all the energy that they have in fighting against their defects when the energy that they have, they would have had to put it into something else, something positive, which is a development of the virtues of the strength of the talents that they have. And this is what, in fact, leadership is about. It is the capacity of identifying strength in yourself and in the others. 
identifying talents. Looking for talents in yourself, in the others. And trying to transform this talent into something great. Something that's going to change something. Change the world. I will give you a very, some practical example of that. But keep in mind, this is, Aristotle tells us, a magnanimous man is a man that considers himself worthy of great things. So at the beginning of magnanimity, there is a sense of, of worth, the sense of dignity. I am not a vegetable. I am not a simple animal. I have a spirit, and this spirit has no limitation. And there are, there are talents here I have to use. I have to contribute with this talent. I have to multiply it. I have to identify it first of all. How do you multiply this talent? How do you identify it? How do you develop magnanimity? By spending time with magnanimous people. My students very often ask me, I want to be like that. Okay, how do I do this? You need to identify the magnanimous ones. And you need to spend time with the magnanimous ones. You spend time with magnanimous people when you read good books. Books about magnanimous people. Because you spend time with the heroes of that book. You spend time with them when you watch good movies. Where magnanimous people are involved. You spend time with them when you hear good music. Music that raises the level of your spirit. There is a music for the small-minded, yes, and there is a music for the magnanimous. All of us, we have, of course, our own taste, and we cannot here discuss about taste and colors, but there is a kind of music that is for the magnanimous, a music that brings you towards beauty, a music that develops in you, the, I would say, the best thing that there are in your heart and in your mind. And there is a kind of music that brings you down, that brings you down. That's true. You spend time with music, with good music, you develop magnanimity. You spend time with magnanimous people, you develop magnanimity. You try to identify your talents, you multiply them. You try to identify your mission in life. All of us, we have a mission. What is a mission? A mission is that specific thing that we see we feel that we have to accomplish. And that specific thing depends a lot on the awareness of your own talents. If you're not aware of your talents, you will never understand what is the specific thing you are called to do. You understand that specific thing only when you become to be aware of the own talents that you have. Magnanimity. And the second virtue of leadership is the virtue of humility. In this context of, of leadership, humility is the capacity to serve the others. It's not a feeling, I repeat. It's a virtue. So it is, it is action, repeated action. The way you serve on a long-term period shows that you have humility. In the end of the day, leadership is about achieving greatness by bringing out, bringing out greatness in the others. This is a definition of leadership. Achieving greatness by bringing out the greatness in the others. You serve people when you bring out greatness in them. Of course, you serve people when you clean their, sh their shoes. But the best way to serve people, the best, the ultimate way of service is to bring out greatness in the others, in your subordinates, in your employees, in your children. This is the absolute way of service because you help them become what they are called to become. And this is an act of magnanimity and humility at the same time. Greatness in service. Those two words cannot be separated from one another. It's not just greatness for greatness, no. It's greatness in order to serve. 
You want greatness because you feel I am a human being. I have my dignity. And if I want to fulfill my humanness, I have to be great. I'm called to this. But how do I achieve this greatness? Well, I achieve this greatness by thinking in terms of achieving this in the others. That's it. By serving the others, by helping them, by educating them, by transforming them, I achieve personal greatness. And the measure of your own greatness is, in fact, the greatness of the people you serve. If the people you serve do not develop greatness, do not achieve greatness, do not develop as human beings, you've collapsed as a leader. Whatever you've done, you've collapsed. Even a business leader, he has collapsed. If his people, if his employees are not developing as people, but they're just making money, he has collapsed. I told the business community, business is not about making money. Business is about, is about developing people. It's about bringing out greatness in people. It's about personal organizational greatness. And by doing this, you make a lot of money. You make a lot of money by doing this. But as a leader, you think first of all of people. People. Leadership is about human beings. It's about people. It's not about things. So a leader, the first thing he's worried about is doing those things. Am I growing? Are my people growing? If not, I am not doing a leadership thing. What I am doing is management. If I am, in, if I am just worried about material results or things we're going to achieve together, then I am not, this is not leadership. This is what we call management. To get things done. But many people know how to get things done, destroying the people that get those things done. There are a lot of examples in history. You get things done on a short term, and you have destroyed all the people inside. But you got it, you got it done. Leadership is another vision of things. It's the vision in which people are the most important thing. And the results, they come naturally as a consequence of the creativity, of the magnanimity, of the virtue that you develop in others in this process. Focus on people and you have the results you want. But your motivation is individuals, people, human being, their growth. I know a lot of business people, really, they, they, they think in terms of their own people and they get the, the results they have is just, are just incredible. But they've never thought about their dividends in the end of the year. They think about growth of human beings, and they don't think in terms of money. The money is necessary in business, no money, no business. But profit is not the aim of business. So what I'm telling you here in the, to the military is the same, the same dial, the same conversation we could have even with the business community. Because the great business people understand this very well. Leadership is about human beings. And <clears throat> management is just, is something different. It's about things. I want to give you a nice example that can help you understand what really service is in leadership. I met that man in central France two years ago. He's now 84. You heard about the company Michelin. Well, with France we say Michelin, but I would try to say Michelin. <laughs> It's a women name, Michelin, in, in France. So, okay, Michelin, the grandfather of that man, when I came to see him, Francois Michelin, two years ago, I, I spoke three hours with him at lunchtime, and I asked him, tell me the story of your organization. Why is it so famous, and how did you become the number one in the world in the tire industry? He told me the story of his grandfather. My grandfather, Edward, was the founder of her company. He was an engineer. He was a businessman, and he was a philosopher. And he was very humble, and he was very magnanimous. One day, a young man called Marius Mignol came to the company, knocked at the door, and said, I want to work for you. The chief of staff received him and asked him, OK, Mr. Mr. Mignol, but uh, do you have education? Do you have degree? And Mr. Mignol answered her, or hence and him, I don't remember if it was a man or woman. I have no formal education. 
but had been working for a few years in, a, in the printing industry. So she thought over and she told him, okay, we take you, and they sent him to the printing department of Michelin. After a few days or a few months, Edouard Michelin, the CEO of the organization, heard about that, and he called immediately the chief of staff, and he told him, are you crazy? Are you crazy? You've sent to the printing department a place where we are not going to get to know that man well. He's not even going to get to know himself well because there is not much to do there. A man just because he has no formal education. What's that? Are you crazy? Remember, you have to break the stone in order to discover the diamond that is hidden inside. Break the guy. Send him to the import expert department of the organization. They send to the import expert department, commercial department, a man without any formal education. After a month, Edouard Michelin came down to meet the new people who were working there, and he saw on the table of that man, Marius Mignol, a kind of converter, a ruler, something to convert the currencies very quickly, because he was dealing with international markets. He, he looked at that as an engineer, and he said, this man, this man is a genius. He has nothing to do here. Send him to the research department. <laughs> you see, Edouard Michelin was looking for talents. He, was looking to, he wanted to get to know people well. And he wanted those people to get to know themselves well in order that they could put their talents at the service of society of the whole world. He was an educator. He was a philosopher. He was a real leader. He wanted to bring out the greatness in each and every human being that was working for him. They sent him to that department. What was the problem? The problem at that time was very simple. Cars were going faster and faster, but the tires were warming up, and it was very dangerous for, for people to drive. More than 100 kilometers per hour, tires were burning. They were burning, and nobody, knew, nobody understood how do you stop this process of heating? How do you stop? So in the Michelin company, there were incredible mathematicians and physicists there trying to understand how this works, the process of stopping this, pro this heating. And nobody understood. Nobody could come to a conclusion. And they were the best mathematicians and physicists we had in France from Ecole Polytechnique. And then came a man without any formal education who was supposed to work there and try to, to, to understand how these work. And this man, through contemplation, observation, passion, passion for the tire, without any mathematics, discovered that if you put inside the wire, radial, not parallel, but radial wires, we stop the process of heating of the, of the tire. Pure intuition, contemplation, a big talent, a big, incredible talent. And this man changed the whole industry of the tire. This is the radial was born, the radial tire was born from the genius of a very simple man without any formal education. But the problem is, and my question is, how do you produce Marius Mignol? Marius Mignol was not produced by himself. Marius Mignol was produced by a great leader who was obsessed with this idea of transforming people, helping people identify and multiply their talents so that they can put it at the service of the organization, the country, and the whole world. So the question in the corporate culture of this, of this organization, which is very specific in France, everybody knows Michelin is a very specific place. Many people will never go there to work. Many people will never go there to work. But if you go to Michelin and you say, I have a Harvard diploma, a Harvard degree, MBA, PhD, they will say you're very good. Marcel Mignol had no degree. Can you do what he did with your Harvard diploma? <laughs> what are they going to tell him? They're going to tell this guy, we have to test you. 
The fact that you have a Harvard PhD is a good thing. We are not going to split on that, but we have to know you and you have to know yourself. So we have to test you. We have to put you in different places, in different circumstances where you are going to be able to identify your talent and we as an organization will be also able to identify your talent. And at the end of the day, you will be where you have to be. So don't ask me where you will be in four years because we don't have any idea. There is no career plan here. People are put where they have to be according to their own talents, identified by our own organization. 90% of French people will never go to work there. They want security of employment and they want security in salary. But people with greatness, people capable of taking a risk, people who want to know who am I and want to put this at the service society, will go to Michelin, will go to work there. And you build what we call a corporate culture. People identify. It is a unique company in France that have a very precise corporate culture. It's, it's incredible. It's a, very, it's a kind of miracle. It has a corporate culture that is very identifiable. And it is based on the history of one man, Mar Marius Mignol. The history of a man coached, directed by a great, incredible leader. What I'm telling you those things, I'm telling you this, although this has to do with business, but this is because this has nothing to do with business. It is how do we serve people? Many people say, well, we serve when we, we help people to do certain things. Yeah, we serve anytime we help people. We try to help them in their material needs, spiritual needs, whatever it is. But we help them mostly when we help them develop as human beings, identify their talents, multiply. And this is, in fact, in the end of the day, what virtuous leadership is about. The specific virtues of leaders are magnanimity and humility, greatness and service. Remember, magnanimity and humility always together. Your magnanimity has to be humble, which means that your magnanimity has to be directed towards the service of others. It's not just magnanimity, it's humble magnanimity which is directed toward the service of other people. And when you've said that, you come to the conclusion that leadership is much more than what we think. First of all, leadership is not a technical activity. All of us, we understand that. Leadership is not about manipulation. It's not about reading books on psychology. It's not, it's about, it's not about manipulating people. It's not about manipulate, manipulating <laughs> our employees or our clients, it's about achieving greatness and bringing out the greatness in the others. But because magnanimity and humility are the specific virtues of leaders, we understand that magnanimity, that leadership is a real ideal of life. Because you cannot base, or I would say like this, you can and must base your actions on prudence, Justice, self-control, courage. Each of your actions as an ethical human being or just a simple human being that has a sense of his own dignity, you understand you have to base all your actions on those four fundamental virtues. But you cannot base your life on prudence. You cannot base your life on self-control. You cannot base your life on courage, but you can base your life on magnanimity and humility. You can base your life on these two ideals of greatness and service. These are virtues of the heart, which means that they are general virtues, they are wide virtues. They <coughs> They inform, as we say in English, they inform the whole of your personality. When you say about a woman, she's courageous, you say good for her. But when you say about her, she's magnanimous, you say, wow. 
That is a great difference, a very great difference. When you say magnanimous, you say the all thing, it's the will, it's the intellect, it's the heart, it's the all personality that is great. A magnanimous person is a person that judges everything in terms of small or big, small or great, I would say. He knows he's in the past toward the truth. He's in the truth because he practices already prudence, practical wisdom. So he knows he's on the path. He's on the right path. But on the right path, he will, he will say what is small on the right path is wrong. He sees everything from the point of view of greatness and smallness. He will not educate his children in terms of right and wrong. What is wrong, he will say to his children, that's small. It's not for you. It's not for us. It's a complete different way of seeing things. Good people say right and wrong. That's right. Do it. That's wrong. Don't do it. Magnanimous people, they say they are children or the people they serve. We are here on the right path. So everything we do here is not wrong. But for me, if you do the small thing, that is wrong. So I would say they focus on greatness all the time. It is the criteria for thinking. It's the criteria for their feeling. It's the criteria for their heart. It's the criteria for action. It is the criteria for their whole life. Same thing with humility. Service. Service informs the whole of your life. You are here to serve. It's your mission. It's the deepest thing that is in your heart. And you see everything from, from this point of view. Working in that place, am I serving? Can I serve? How do I serve? How do I help people develop and grow where I am? And if I find a place here, I stay here. If I don't find a place for that, I will, not, I will go away. Because this is not, this is, or it is not an ideal for my life. So you see, and I finish here, leadership is much more than what people think. It's not a technical activity. It is not only a spiritual activity. It is a real life ideal. That is why it has to be attractive. And it is attractive for people that have big heart. People with a big heart want to practice leadership because they instinctively understand when I do those things, when I practice leadership, I transform myself. And in the end of the day, I fulfill my goal. It is self-realization. It is what the ancient Greek were used to say, become who you are. Pindar. This is before even Aristotle and Plato. Pindar wrote this very famous sentence, become what you are. He meant, you, we are human beings. Okay. But if we want to be real human beings, we have to practice the virtues. If not, we will never become real human beings. The highest way to become a human being is the practice of the human virtues. So become who you are. It is, I would say, it is what leadership is about. Helping people become who they are. And by you yourself helping them become who they are, you yourself become, become who you are. Magnanimity, humility, greatness, service. Two words, never separate them from one another. They are the substance of what leadership is about. Very often we speak about ethical leadership. We speak even about virtuous leadership, but we have in mind the fundamental virtues, the full one. I tell you, the full one, you have to practice them. They are foundational. But you can be good without being a leader. If you have the four, you're good. But if you don't lack, if you lack the two specific to leadership, you're just a good man or a good woman. But you have, there is no leadership in your life. Magnanimity and humility. These are the specific virtues of leaders. These are two words I would like you never to forget. They are just simple and they are two. In the end of the day, a soldier, a warrior, if he has this, he will not do what's written in the rules. He will do what his virtue tells him to do. He will free. And he will do the great thing. I'm not saying he will not obey the rules. 
<laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm saying that he will be directed, not by the rules. His mind, his heart, his will will be directed by his virtues. He will do in the end of the day what his virtues tell him to do. He will not be the kind of guy in conflict, can I do that or cannot I do that? I'm a lawyer, I know what this means. It's crazy. He will do what his heart will tell him to do and his heart it is all his virtues together. And these are great men and great people. They have no frustration in life. They don't feel frustrated. They know what they have to do because they know who they are. I did that because I am that. And that's it. Not because in the law it's written, don't do that and don't do that, but do that. No. I did this because this is me. This is just me. Not because somewhere it's written, I have to do it. It is virtue ethics. I do not deny the power of rule-based ethics. No. Rules are important. But we say that rules don't set people free. What gives freedom to individuals gives creativity and power. It's virtue. And people there are authentic to themselves. They are really themselves. And they don't need to be directed. They practice the virtue of practical wisdom, prudence. In any situation, they see what they have to do. They understand it quite immediately, instinctively. They don't need to look in a code, in a book. Do you remember 10 years ago in that school, what, 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 did, what, what did they tell us about what we have to do in such a situation? You will never think in terms like this. They will be very, very rapid in their way of thinking. This, these are the things I don't do. These are the things I do. In this situation, I understand well what I have to do, and I do it. This is practical wisdom. The capacity for direct and rapid action on the foundation of your own being, who you are as a human being. You don't have to look outside yourself to find a solution. The solution is inside you. It's a part of you. It's who you are. Good. So I want to finish here because I can speak 10 hours, and I would like to give you time for questions. 